every day I get emails and phone calls from people having difficulties with aliens in their personal lives. I, I deal with them all. They're all sincere. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, what we're doing in SETI today, how we're trying to find the uh, aliens. This is one of the three projects that I think is going to bear fruit in the first half of the 21st century, where you're living now, that will really change everything. Right? One, we're understanding biology. You've heard a little bit about that. That, will, that has obvious consequences. Secondly, we're inventing our successors, namely thinking machines. Right? Uh, I don't know what that really means for your future job prospects, but it seems to be something that won't be stopped. And the third thing that will happen in this century that I think is very important, of course, is finding that you're not the only biology around. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and maybe give you a little bit of astronomy, which will be good for what's left of your souls. Um, the first thing I do is point out to you that the real reason we think there's life in space is not because we've found it. We haven't found any, dead or alive, to quote the last president. We haven't found any life, even microbes, not even dead microbes, okay? But space is big, really big. As Douglas Adams said, this is a, one of the Hubble Deep Field photos, and you can see all these galaxies. These are all galaxies, with the exception of two nearby stars that pollute the photo, okay? Each one of these galaxies has typically a few hundred billion stars, and there are 150 billion galaxies that we could photograph. So that's a big number. That's the number of stars in the visible universe. That's 10,000 billion billion, for those of you who don't like the notation. Now, what we know now that we didn't know even a year ago is that most of these stars have planets, right? I occasionally talk to Jeff Marcy here in San Francisco, who has found more planets than any other hominid, and I ask him every year, I say, so Jeff, if you had perfect telescopes, what fraction of stars do you think would show planets? And he says 70 or 80 percent. Okay. And in astronomy, 70 or 80 percent is the same as all. In astronomy, pi is equal to one. Okay, so there you go. Now, that means in our galaxy, you, you'll never see this from San Francisco, but you can see photos of it. In our galaxy, there are roughly a trillion planets. And while most of those will be worthless, like Mercury or Neptune, which never have been big in your life, it can't be that all of them are worthless. If so, you're a miracle. Okay? And I know you like to think you're a miracle, that's the fault of your mom, but the facts are, <laughs> but the facts are that astronomy has a long history of believing in miracles and being wrong every time it did. Like we're the center of the cosmos, or the sun is the center of the cosmos, or even that the Milky Way is the center of the cosmos, something that was believed only 100 years ago. Okay, well, that's a lot of planet pleasure, but the question is, what fraction of those planets had the kind of salubrious climate that we have here on Earth? And the answer to that is, we don't know the answer to that. But we're, we're trying to find out. I mean, the, the Kepler Space Telescope, which was in the news this week because it's got mechanical problems, but there's still plenty of data to come in, is tasked with finding out what fraction of stars, like the sun, have a planet that might be like the Earth. And while we don't yet know, these are some of the results from uh, Kepler. I always point out that every time you show a graph, you lose 10% of the audience. So I have 12 graphs. The, the, interesting, the interesting part of this plot is that lower right-hand corner, which is where the Earth would be, with a period of 365 days, a number known to some of you, and with a radius about one Earth radius. You'll see there are no planets from Kepler there, but that's only because the data are still being analyzed. They're the hardest to find. But they will be found in the next two years, and uh, you can be sure that there are plenty of Earth-like worlds. Well, what have we found? We found, well, here's fairly recent data. We found nine worlds that could have liquid water on the surface, could have an oxygen or some sort of thick atmosphere. So those are the habitable worlds, nine. The total number of planets that has been found that are confirmed, that are known to be real planets, is roughly 900. So what does that say? 1% of planets are sort of like the Earth. 1% is a lot in a galaxy with a trillion planets. Okay, plenty of real estate. All right. Here's something else for you, just for your edification. This is a picture I made in northwestern Australia years ago. But that's some very old rock. That's three and a half billion year old rock. And you can see in there some uh, things that look like fossilized cauliflowers, but are really fossilized stromatolites. Those are bacterial colonies that lived three and a half billion years ago. Three and a half billion years ago is almost all the way back to the birth of the Earth. In other words, the Earth gets formed, and right away, there's biology. And that suggests that maybe biology isn't a miracle. Maybe it's just some sort of cosmic infection that occurs all the time. 
I know you don't like to think of yourselves that way. <laughs> Although in case of some of my family, it's true. Okay, now, if we want to find not just life in space, because, you know, there are a lot of attempts to find life in space. We have rovers going to Mars. They're, they're not looking for life, but they will soon. Uh, there, there are six other places in the solar system that might have the conditions for life, just in our own backyard. But if you want to find the kind of life that you see in the multiplex on the weekends, the kind that can hold up its side of the conversation, you have to use SETI. All right? You have to do something that finds intelligent life. This idea occurred more than a half century ago to this guy, Frank Drake. He still works at the SETI Institute. He used this antenna in West Virginia. It's a photo I made about a year and a half ago. It's still there. It's still working. And he pointed it in the direction of a couple of nearby stars hoping to eavesdrop the way Jodie Foster tried. Right? The movie Contact on uh, alien broadcasts. He didn't hear anything, but on the other hand, he started a whole field. Now, let me just point out something. This is, a, you know, here you have some Antarctic exploration. SETI is unlike science that you learned about in middle school, right, where they told you, well, you have this hypothesis, and then you, uh, you design an experiment to falsify the hypothesis. Well, some science works like that. Actually, not so much, but some does, but not SETI. There's no way you can falsify the hypothesis that somebody is out there. There's no way you can prove they're not out there. There are a zillion ways you can miss them. But what you can hope to do is prove that they are out there. So that makes it exploration. You could sit around in the bars of Europe and argue about whether there was a continent at the bottom of the globe back in the 1700s. But the only real way to answer that question was to stop having the beer, get on a ship, and head for southern latitudes. You had to do the experiment. OK, so that's what we're doing. This is the Allen Telescope Array. And this is about 300 miles from where you're sitting, up in northern California behind the Cascades. There are 42 antennas, and we're using this to look at various things, which I'll tell you about. We're looking at these planets that Kepler has found, or planetary candidates, because at least we know there are planets there. That's not so important anymore, actually, because now we know that most stars have planets. So you might as well point the antenna at nearby stars. The signals will be stronger. Uh, we're also looking at the center of the galaxy. I don't know how many of you have been to the center of the galaxy. It's a happening place, even more so than Milpitas, because the center of the galaxy, 28,000 light years from here, right? is, you know, there's a, a million times as much stuff per cubic inch as there is around here. There's a giant black hole for your energy needs plus entertainment. Any really advanced society that's arisen in the last 12 billion years of the Milky Way's history may have put a giant transmitter down there, right, to, I don't know, broadcast the galactic internet, GPS, or maybe just used car ads. Nobody knows, but if they put a big transmitter there, they know everybody will look at the center. Today I'm going to proselytize for red dwarfs. I think we should be pointing our antennas at red dwarfs. Now those of you from the UK are probably confusing this with a TV show. But I'm not talking about those kind of red dwarfs. I'm talking about small stars. They're small, they're dim. Again, that makes me think of my brother. They're small, they're dim, okay, and, but there are a lot of them. And in, 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 you can't see any with your naked eye, by the way. You need at least a pair of binoculars to see any red dwarfs. They're that dim. It's not that there aren't a lot of them around. But why, why pick red dwarfs? People never thought much about red dwarfs as habitats uh, for aliens. And the reason was they had small habitable zones. They want a habitable zone. What is it? Is there a habitable zone in New Jersey? Yes. You see, those are small stars at the bottom, sun-like stars at the middle, bright stars at the top, and the green area around there, and this is just high school geometry, the green area is that distance from the stars where a planet could have liquid water on its surface. And you'll notice for the dim stars, it's very narrow. There's no magic in that. It's, it's just geometry. OK, so that was one strike against these guys. The other strike was this. In order to be in the habitable zone of a dim star, you've got to be a planet pretty close in, so it's not cold. right? But if you're pretty close in, your planet gets tidally locked. right? Now, what happens when you get tidally locked? Tidally locked just means that one side faces the star all the time, like the moon. You may think the fact that one side of the moon is always facing the Earth is just coincidence. It's not. It will happen every time, right? It's just a little bit of orbital mechanics. And so what was thought was, you know, any of those planets that might be habitable, they're not going to be, because one side's going to be facing the star all the time. It's going to be incredibly hot. The other side's going to be incredibly cold. And if there's any atmosphere, it's just going to freeze out and pile up as useless snow on the back side. Well, it turned out that, once again, astronomers were wrong because that was very naive. Any real world like this might have winds, and the winds will carry the heat from the hot side to the dark side, and there will be some region in the middle, some strip there, 
where everything is hunky-dory, okay? So, I mean, this, this would be, make great science fiction stories, you know, uh, aliens living on these strips of temperate climated planets. Anyhow, so I think we ought to look at them. Uh, here's another point on them. To begin with, three-quarters of all stars are red dwarfs, so they're all over the place, and that means if you're looking at a thousand targets, they're going to be a lot closer if you pick red dwarfs because there's so many more of them, okay? And the other thing is that uh, this is a recent result from Harvard, but one in six of them has an Earth-like world, it seems. One in six. And not only that, they're old, because red, red dwarfs never die. They're so small, they, they just sip their fuel. That means that every red dwarf ever born is still shining today. And, and this is one, maybe the only case where older is better. Because what it means is they've had more time to develop clever life. When do we find them? Well, the speed of our search is going up exponentially. It's following Moore's law. And in fact, that's just technology. And if you just sort of make this little plot about when we're going to find ET, uh, it depends on how many societies are out there. Carl Sagan thought it was like a million. That's that first number. Uh, Isaac Asimov figured it was a couple hundred thousand. Frank Drake himself figures 10,000. It, it doesn't matter what these, the details here. What this says is that we're going to find ET in the next 20 or 25 years. If any of these assumptions is right, you're going to see it happen. That's why I bet everybody a cup of Starbucks will find ET by 2030. And if not, at least you get a cup of coffee. All right. Uh, let me just finish up by saying, what will the aliens be like? I occasionally go down to Hollywood and talk to movie producers. They always ask, what will they be like? They always assume it's going to be a little gray guy like this, uh, which is just a projection of us in the future when everybody's designing websites, so our eyes have gotten bigger. This is another projection that came a couple of weeks ago. Somebody in, in, in the field of genetics projected that this is what was going to be happening. I guess they were looking around the audience. Everybody's looking at little screens. But I think that this is the plot that tells you what the real aliens will be like. This is Hans Morvich, Carnegie Mellon. He just plotted the, um, the amount of compute power you can buy per thousand dollars ever since 1900 and it keeps going up. The bottom line of this figure is very simple. By 2020, your laptop will have more compute power than a human brain. Your laptop already has more memory than a human brain. That doesn't mean that that laptop's going to start telling you what to type, but it does mean that in this century, we're probably going to invent our successors. And that's very important because this becomes a time scale argument. Here you see Marconi on the left, 1900, he invents practical radio, okay? Fewer than 50 years later, we already had computers. They, they were big, but we had computers. And sometime in this century, we'll probably invent strong AI, thinking machines. Maybe we'll do it by 2050, maybe it'll take to 2100, maybe it'll take to 2200. It doesn't matter, they're all the same number. The facts are, you invent radio, and then within a few centuries, you've replaced yourself as the intellectual dominate, uh, dominating th entity, whatever it is, in, on, your, uh, on your planet. So that means that ET isn't going to be some sort of soft, squishy, biological being like they always are in the movies. If we find a signal, and I bet you a cup of coffee here, that we'll find one you know, before you've reached middle age, most of you, uh, don't expect it to be a little soft, squishy gray guy with big eyeballs, no hair, and no sense of humor at the other end. Because it's very much more likely that it'll be some sort of machine. Thank you very much. <laughs>